This is the second of two videos looking at camera-like projection in WebGL. In the last video, we looked at the process you'll go through to add model, view, and projection matrices to your programs, and I showed you a few examples where things went poorly. This video is going to look a bit more closely at this and see if we can't build up a better understanding of both what the projection matrix is for and why we sometimes get clipping and z-fighting, ruining our renders. This is an example of what we saw last time. Back then I said this is caused by our near and far planes. What we're looking at is supposed to be a cube, but part of it extends past the near plane and it's getting clipped and part of it extends past the far plane, so it's also getting clipped. So we're only seeing a narrow middle band of the cube, the part that's still between the near and far planes. In case this didn't make 100% intuitive sense, there is another way to visualize this by actually looking at our geometry after it's gone through this model view projection transformation. And that's what this code does. After going through a normal model view projection transformation, I've simply added a second pair of view and projection matrices. At the top we get our original view with its own viewport, and below we get a different perspective of those same vertices. I've added a transparent gray box to represent WebGL's clip space, which you should immediately recognize. That's the 2x2x2 two by two by two region of space that we've been drawing to this entire time since the start of this series. Whenever we've set our GL position value in our vertex shader, we've been trying to get that coordinate inside this 2x2x2 two by two by two cube. The first thing to notice is that at the bottom the cube isn't really a cube anymore. It's been stretched along the z-axis by about three to four hundred percent, and it's it's not solid. Parts of it are growing and shrinking as it spins. And that's what our projection matrix is doing, though right now this only seems to affect things along the z-axis because of the near and far planes. If we make these planes even closer, You'll see how much less of the cube is visible in our top viewport, but also how much more the cube gets stretched at the bottom. We don't really get a sense of this stretching in the top view at all, which is completely by design. All of our transformations are done in a way that hides the stretching and contorting and squashing, so that when we look at it from the front everything looks normal and correct. Look at what happens when we move the cube back. The cube has vanished from the main view, and that's because no part of it is inside the clip space anymore. It's completely behind it, beyond the far plane. And if we undo that and adjust our near and far planes around the cube more carefully, now our entire cube is visible. Let's see what happens if we move our near plane back to something more reasonable, like 10. Again, no apparent change in our main view, but in the lower view our cube appears to have been crushed flat against the back, the far plane. Again, this was done just by changing the near plane, and it didn't affect our main render at all. And this is just the sort of thing that we'd want to do if we had more stuff to fit in, in front of the cube. This space available to us hasn't changed. Our gray box is still exactly the same size it was before, but now we can put other stuff in it, in front of the current cube. Okay, so if moving the near and far planes gives us so much more room, why not just make near super tiny and far super big all the time? That's a great question. Let's find out. Right, this is Z fighting and it happens whenever you compress your geometry too much. It happens when WebGL can no longer tell what's on top. Why? Well, WebGL uses its depth buffer to keep track of that. The depth buffer uses floating point numbers. Floating point numbers have a lot of precision, but it's not infinite. So when you smush too much, there's no precision left to keep your things apart. This is especially common when your objects are both far away and close to each other. Anyway, in case it's not clear, not smushing enough causes clipping. Smushing too much causes z-fighting. So try to smush just the right amount. For what it's worth, in my experience, most of this can be avoided by being careful about the near plane value. Why not the far plane? Well, 
first because far is usually out of your hands anyway. It's defined by your 3D world and what you want to put in it. But also, because of the math involved, it's kind of amazing how much you can let far go before you run into Z-fighting issues. But go too small even a little bit with near, and you'll get Z-fighting right away. I've personally found 0.1 is a good, safe starting point. If I encounter near-plane clipping at that level, it usually means I should move my camera. I'm, I'm not keeping a safe distance from my geometry. But it all depends on what you're trying to do. Now, I want to revisit the orthographic projection matrix again. Even if you're not interested in this visual style, it's totally worth it, because it's the one that makes it blindingly obvious what's going on. Also, let's switch to a different model. So, for geomatrix with ortho, you have to specify all six bounds of the orthographic frustum. To create the perspective projection matrix, we only had to specify the near and far, but with ortho we've got to give all six, left and right, bottom and top, and near and far. So if I put in negative one and one for everything, we see things are pretty badly clipped, but now we can tell why. Really, the biggest problem is that the far plane is too close. Move the far farther back, and now the entire camera fits in between the near and far planes. Notice that the camera is still escaping our clip space, but it's clipping through the top, bottom, and sides. And yes, this absolutely is still clipping, though to us it just looks like parts of the object are simply off-screen. So clipping along these axes rarely looks like a bug. But when we move our left and right and bottom and top bounds out a bit, we can, in effect, zoom out. Okay, in case it's not absolutely clear yet, the left, right, bottom, top, and near far planes of our ortho function, they map exactly to the faces of WebGL's clip space, that 2x2x2 two by two by two volume of space that we've been drawing to since the beginning of this series. And though it may really feel like it, we're not expanding our clip space at all. Clip space is basically set in stone, with a width and height and depth that can't be changed, at least for now in WebGL. So these left-right, bottom-top, near-far values? They're there to tell WebGL how to squish our 3D world and everything in it so that the right things fit into the right places in our clip space. Or, more accurately, they're therefore creating a projection matrix that scales everything so that the right things are in the right places and look perfectly correct from the front. Makes sense for ortho, right? But it's also going on for the perspective function, too. Before you watch this video, chances are you've seen this. This is called the perspective frustum. It's a pyramid-shaped volume that describes our field of view, the shape of the entire volume of space that's visible to us when we use perspective projection. And the faces of that frustum also map exactly to the faces of WebGL's clip space. The math is more complicated. Instead of mapping a cuboid to a cube, which is what orthographic projection does, we're mapping a trapezoidal prism to a cube. So different math, but it's the same thing. So when I look at the frustum now, I see a cube that's been squeezed into that weird shape and needs the projection matrix so it can bounce back out into its cube form. That's the projection matrix's job, to precisely smush all of 3D space so that the frustum and its contents can realign with WebGL's clip space cube. Near plane gets stretched, far plane gets squashed, and the trapezoidal planes at the top, bottom, and sides they get smushed, so that everything's a two-by-two two square again. From the front, those things that remain between all these faces, they get drawn. The things that don't, they get clipped, or they get culled. And all of this so that, from the front, things look perfectly correct. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say in this video. A little mind-bendy at the end, but hopefully not too bad. If you want to explore these visualizations, go to this video series GitHub page, and you can download the JavaScript files that I used in this video, as well as the binary camera model file. I don't know if this will be any help, but I hope it does.